laws of physics are constant and uniform. Now, if such a universe has expanded for only thousands of years, gas would disperse so quickly that stars would never form. On the other hand, if such a universe has expanded for quadrillions of years or more, all stars would be black holes or neutron stars. Only in such a universe that is billions of years old can a star like the sun and a planet like Earth exist. So since I see stars and planets, I'm persuaded that indeed the universe must be billions of years old. And also, if the universe is only thousands of years old, we wouldn't see any burnt-out stars. Uh, there would be no large supernova remnants, and we see an abundance of both. All right, so Hugh, when you look through, you see a whole bunch of age. You see billions of years, right? Right. Okay, right. So, so Jason... When you look through a telescope, do you see billions of years or do you see thousands? I mean, uh, what do you see when you look through a telescope? I see a universe that was supernaturally created by God thousands of years ago. I think the evidence is very consistent with that. And, uh, of course, I will um, you know, encourage people to, to understand that this issue is largely determined by your worldview. You're, you can think of that like mental glasses. The reason we see different things when we look at the same universe is that we're wearing different mental glasses, as it were. And I can temporarily take off my uh, my biblical creation glasses and put on my, my Hugh Ross glasses and take a look at the universe from the perspective of millions of years, and I can understand why he draws the conclusions that he does. But my point is, if I start from a straightforward reading of Scripture and I look at the universe, I find it's very consistent. And, uh, you know, there are lots of scientific arguments. Maybe we'll get into some of those a little bit later. But, but, but Jason, hold on. Let me, let me stop you there for a second. Yeah. But the way that people have come to Christ throughout most of history has not been to have the Bible first— I mean, what about the argument from general revelation? I mean, I was an atheist for 27 years. I, I didn't, quote, get the Bible first and then look at the sky. I was looking at the sky going, oh, wow, there must be a creator. It was that kind of thing. And what you're saying is I've got to have the Bible to understand what I'm seeing right. But the reality is a lot of people are looking either, you know, at, through a microscope or and seeing design in a cell, or they're looking at the sky and saying, oh, my gosh, there's got to be a creator, right? Well, you know, God gives everyone some grace to be able to understand things and to, and to be able to understand him. God makes it very clear that he has revealed himself to all people through nature. So there is something to general revelation. That's fine. But revelation, general revelation, doesn't tell us as much as what I think uh, some, some people would like to pull from it. I, I'd say general revelation tells us three things. It tells us that there is a God, and in particular the biblical God. It tells us his righteous standards. That is, there's a certain standards of behavior that are hardwired into us. And three, it tells us that we cannot live up to God's standard, and therefore we're deserving of God's wrath. And I can support all those with uh, scriptures, particularly in the Romans. All it, right, it, but Jason, it, it, hold on. We, we, you went, in the very beginning, you said, I see thousands of years supernaturally created by God. I think every Christian would agree with you. But the problem, well, not on the thousands part, but certainly on the, the creation part. But here's the problem for me is when you see the distance bes between different galaxies, do you... You know, they may say it's you know it's a hundred million light years. Do you translate that into I don't know certain thousands of years? Are the distances wrong? The distances I think are right. I think there's good scientific reasons to believe that those distances are vast. But you see, just because something is very big doesn't necessarily mean that it's very old. God certainly has the power to create a very very big universe. I think you and I would agree that God has the power to create it instantaneously. The question is, how did He do it? And I would argue that he did it the way he says he did it in the scriptures, and that uh, it's very clear that he created in six days. But, but uh, and Hugh, let me go back to you on this one. But it is expanding. You both agree with an, an expanding universe. I think the evidence is overwhelmingly clear on that. But if you just wind it back, if it's expanding at a certain rate now and you just wind the clock back, it's more than thousands of years, right? Well, that's right. I mean, uh, if the universe's age is going to be its present size divided by the expansion rate, and to sustain a young date, one must prove that the universe is a million times smaller, uh, which Jason uh, says that's not the case, or the expansion rate is a million times faster, or clocks are running a million times faster in the distant universe. And those are all things astronomers can check. Also, it's something you can check by going to the Bible. The Bible repeatedly tells us that the laws of physics don't change. So if there's no change in the laws of physics, then indeed the universe must be billions of years old.
Jason, one of the things that young Earth uh, astronomers often say is that maybe the speed of light has changed or that, you know, God created the whole thing, uh, you know, with the appearance of age, etc. But what about, you know, the black holes and what about the apparent millions or billions of years of age that's out there? Did God create black holes or were there, you know, a, a star there uh, really or was it just, you know, the, the the whole deception argument that people raise that it seems to be an incredible amount of detail that would make God somewhat of a deceiver. What about that? You know, it's not that God deceives. The problem is we start with anti-biblical assumptions and then we interpret the evidence and it comes out different than what the Bible says and then we say, "Well, God, you deceived me." Well, that's not the issue at all. The problem is we've deceived ourselves. We've started with the assumptions of naturalism, ultimately. And take Adam, for example. Now, God made Adam as an adult. And if you applied naturalistic thinking to that, if you, in other words, if you assumed that Adam right. came about by the same kind of process by which people come about today, you would get a vastly inflated age for Adam, wouldn't you? I, okay, so listen, let's take a break. Because when we come back, I'm going to ask you guys about your walking in the garden, maybe on day seven, and you bump into Adam. Would you see a man that is apparently in his 30s, say, or would you see something else? I, I mean, I don't know. We're talking with Dr. J uh, Jason Lyle and Dr. Hugh Ross, and it's, we're calling it thousands or billions, and it has to do with the age of the earth and the age of the cosmos. We're going to get in now to the age of man and man's origin, as well as maybe dinosaurs and the flood and all of that. So stay tuned. We're going to continue straight ahead here at the intersection of faith and reason on the Frank Pastore Show at 99.5. KKLA. Here's KKLA FM Los Angeles, the intersection of faith and reason here at the Frank Pastore Show. We're talking with Drs. Hugh Ross and Jason Lyle. They're both Christians, both love the Lord, both believe in biblical inerrancy, both hostile to naturalism and evolution, and yet uh, they are both PhDs in astrophysics, and they disagree on uh, some pretty important stuff, uh, typically, the or mainly, the cosmology and the age of the Earth, and we haven't even talked about dinosaurs and the flood and all that kind of stuff. So, Jason, let me start with you in, in this segment. Let's talk about Adam. So if I'm walking around early in the Garden of Eden and I bump into this guy, uh, I look at him, he's in his 30s, it, it would look to be, maybe in his 20s, but he's certainly not you know, six days old kind of thing, and I have no problem with that. If I were to go over to a tree and start hacking through the bark, um, I would expect to see tree rings, and it would give the appearance that you know the tree's you know decades old, maybe. But it's I you know I'm told from scripture it's only six days old. Or if I dated rocks, uh, if I looked at bacteria in a pond somewhere, I get that. Why is it that when people look through a telescope and they see the cosmos, they don't make the same assumption that, well, it's just created with the appearance of age? First of all, is that a, an accurate description of a young Earth view? I think you're, you're right. I would, I would change the terminology just a little bit, though. I, I wouldn't say that Adam appears old. I mean, if you asked Adam how old was he, you say, Adam, do you think you look 30 years old? And you say, what's a 30-year-old? He's, ah. he's on one day old, right? Right. But because we apply um, thinking, natural kind of thinking, we, if we assume that Adam came about the same way that people come about today, we would, we would draw an incorrect conclusion for his age. Likewise for the tree with the rings, likewise for the stars and galaxies. And, you, and so you say, why do people apply a different uh, philosophy when they look at the universe? Well, I think because they're logically inconsistent, because they bought into the pagan uh, reasoning of the day that the universe came about by a natural process. And you, and you know, Frank, every old Earth argument I've ever heard, or old universe argument I've ever heard, actually commits the fallacy of begging the question, which mm -hmm. is that it subtly assumes the very thing that it's trying to uh, prove. And that comes down to this, uh, the fact that the universe was created in, in a mature fashion, according to the scriptures. And I'd like to give you just a couple examples real quick. And I want to borrow these from, from what you said in the, in the previous segment. Uh, you said that stars would never form in a, in a universe that's thousands of years old. But you see, that begs the question, doesn't it? Because in my view, stars d didn't form. God made them, and he made them on the fourth day, according to Genesis 1.16. And so Hugh has effectively assumed that my view of creation is wrong and then come to the conclusion that my view of creation is wrong. Well, it's hardly surprising, given that that's the assumption he started with. All right, well, let's let him respond on, on, on that. So, Dr. Ross, if you bump into Adam, I mean, everything I just said to Jason, what, what, what is your experience? I mean, there's, there's tree rings, there's bacteria, there's Adam that, you know, appears to be what we would say 30 years old. But how do you respond to Jason? I mean, why couldn't God have done that with the whole cosmos? He could have, but he said clearly in his word that he did not. That uh, the heavens declare the glory of God, the heavens uh, reveal the righteousness of God. Psalm 19 refers to uh, the record of nature as a book, 
It's actually in the Belgic Confession, 1561, that God gave us two books, and both books are utterly trustworthy and reliable. God's not going to deceive us through either the Bible or the record of nature, and I would dispute that Adam is an example of appearance of age. He would only be an example of appearance of age if God made him as a baby. But the text is very clear. He was not made as a baby. Uh, God made the chicken first, not the egg. Uh, likewise, I'd say the same thing with uh, Eve. She was not uh, created as a baby. Right. And uh, if a scientist was there measuring the age of Adam, uh, he would not find scar tissue. He wouldn't find uh, you know, any more than 60 milligrams of cholesterol in his blood. All the evidences would be that he was brand new. And, you know, when we look at the universe, we're actually looking back in time. And so astronomers can look back in time and see if there was a moment when stars did not exist. And, in fact, we have photo images of the universe where stars are not existing. Uh, we can see a place where stars exist, but not galaxies. And so as we look back in time, the principle here is the farther away you look, the farther back in time you're seeing because it takes like time to travel to our telescope. But Hugh, it so seems example, as though, no, hold, let me interrupt for a second. It seems as yeah. though if I were to look at Adam or to cut into his tissue or to cut into a tree, under our understanding of time, he's going to be 30 years old and on all the tree rings, Right. But why no, couldn't I, I when I look at, that. Why, okay, that's what I need to know. I need, how, why? I mean, because I would think, why can't you just do that? Stars were created in place, they were, you know, black holes were created, and maybe you're committing the fallacy that Jason talked about. Maybe you're just begging the question. But in astronomy, we directly observe the past. We don't see the present, but we do see the past. And so we can challenge the claim that uh, stars were not formed, that uh, God just simply put them in situ. Well, then how do we explain the fact that we have photo images of the universe where there aren't any stars, or just the cosmic background radiation, and how that cosmic background radiation first leads to stars and star clusters, then galaxies, and we can see the galaxies taking on uh, different characteristics of age, their color changes as we get closer and closer to our galaxy. So we can see a history. It's like looking through a photo album of your grandfather. And you can see the early photos uh, where he's a little toddler, and then he gradually gets older and older. We can do the same thing with the universe. In fact, what makes astronomy such a powerful science for supporting the Christian worldview is we can directly witness a cosmic creation event. And in witnessing the cosmic creation event, we come up with our most powerful evidences that indeed there's a beginning to space, time, matter, and energy. The universe is continuously expanded from that. And I've written a couple of articles where I make the point, the Bible said it first. All right, let me jump in. Cosmology was taught in the Bible. Okay, now I, I get that. And, and then that sounds very plausible to me, Jason, when, when you sang it that way. How would you respond to, to what he just said? Well, there's so much to cover here, and I know I'm not going to get to it all, so let, let me point Well, and that's that, why you both have websites right, and a whole bunch of resources that, and things, so but go ahead. These, uh, a lot of these questions are answered at answersingenesis.org, answersingenesis.org. Dot org. I also have a book on this topic, too, Old Earth Creationism on Trial, and people can get that through the website at answersingenesis.org. Uh, let me hit just a couple issues here real okay, quick. Yeah, we got about two thing. minutes and then another break. Go okay. ahead. Uh, very quickly, then. Um, uh, Hugh said that, that nature is a book. Now, I would dispute that. I think it's okay poetically to call it a book, but not literally. In fact, he said, that, he said something, if I, if, unless I misunderstood him, I think he said that Psalm 19 indicates that. Well, Psalm 19 indicates the exact opposite. If you look at Psalm 19, it's talking about the general revelation of God, but it indicates that it's not a book. If you look in verse 3, it says that there is no speech nor language. Now, you see, a book is comprised of speech and language. It's comprised of sentences, but verse 3 indicates that there is no speech nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, is the way that it's, uh, in fact, the way it's but translated. But read verse DNA 4, the their words go to the ends of the world. Yes, but not, not literally. In fact, because in, in fact, you're going to have a contradiction if you take that literally, isn't it? Because verse 3 says, there is no speech, nor are there words. In other words, Psalm is telling us that there is a message that creation has, but it's not a message comprised of words. It's not a message comprised of sentences. And so I would dispute that claim that there's, a, uh, that there's two books. In fact, uh, I think that will inevitably lead to various theological problems, because you're going to try to interpret God's perfect word in light of man's fallible opinion of, uh, of nature. Well, let's take a break at, at this point. And when we come back, I still want to ask you both about dinosaurs and, and the flood 
and uh, Dr. Ross will have you lead the next segment. And then I also, in, in light of what Jason just said, just I want to know from both of you guys when we come back, what do you think is at stake in, in this dispute? I mean, why, why does it matter that Christians even consider this age of the earth problem or this age of the earth issue. We'll do that straight ahead as we continue here at the intersection of faith and reason with Drs. Hugh Ross and Jason Lyle on the Frank Pastor. 